Welcome to the In the Garage podcast by CarParts.com. I'm your host, Mark DeGrasse, your go-to buddy for all things automotive. From, from the roar of your weekend project car to the hum of your daily drive, we've got you covered. Whether you're a gearhead who loves keeping your cars, trucks, SUVs, and hot rods in tip-top shape, or you're just dipping your toes into the world of automotive, we promise you a ride filled with knowledge, laughs, and top-notch advice from the industry's finest. So buckle up, and let's hit the road together. Before we dive into today's episode, let's take a moment to hear a word from our sponsors, the amazing part partners who make this podcast possible. Download the carparts.com app and accelerate convenience with access to over 850,000 auto parts at your fingertips. We make it easier to find the parts you need anytime, anywhere. Get it now on the Apple App Store and Google Play. Today we have Jeff Fadness, a creator here at carparts.com, and we're talking daily drivers. So, Jeff, you've had over mm-hmm. 20 daily drivers, was that right? Yeah, like cars and motorcycles combined, I th- it's over 20. I, I don't, can't really count at this point, but yeah. That's awesome. But yeah, yeah. Dude, I think I'm like, I think I've had like maybe eight or nine. Yeah. Which is, you, which is good. It's not good to have <laughs> over 20. I don't know. Well, if you're a car guy, it's, a problem. You know, it's, it's not a problem. It's a, uh, it's an adventure. Right? Yeah. yeah. So walk me through that. So you, you go on Craigslist, you yeah. find a, a car. Is it just opportunistic? Like you see yeah. something that's. I mean, it used to be with my first car as it was, you see a ad in the paper, you know, like my first truck was like, like something that we saw an ad, you know, um, in the paper. But then eventually when Craigslist became more prevalent and like people weren't sketched out by it, that's where I began to navigate. Cause like, I'm, you know, uh, I kind of, I don't know if I'm cheap, but I'm just like, You're I cheap, have a hard, t- yeah, I have a hard <laughs> time like paying interest and paying, uh, you know, more insurance. And I just, my parents taught me to pay cash. So that's really where it starts with is just like, I'm going to pay cash for a car. And then usually, you know, I've been pretty good to like throughout all those cars. I've never really lost money. I mm. usually make money. So it's kind of a fun, it's like a fun thing. You know, you drive a car for, for me, it's usually like two years. Um, I'll work on it while I'm driving it. And then uh, I got it for under market when I got it. And so then I can usually sell it for what I got it for or a little bit extra. So yeah, so it's like, I've never, it's a way to buy whatever you want and it doesn't really cost you anything. But that's awesome. So right now you said you have a, uh, a van. Yeah, 2000, I think it's a 2015 Nissan MV200, oh, um, which for me is pretty new. Uh, but it, you know, I love it. And basically, it's a, I look at it as, a, you know, some vehicles are like a toy and, you know, they're fun. And some vehicles I think are purely a tool. And this mm. vehicle is a tool for me. It basically, it's not fun to drive. It's <laughs> slow. It's, you know, it's ugly, but it's, it's, a, it's purely functional and utilitarian. And, um, it's just smart for my life, you know, for, you know, what I do with work, you know, I'm, I'm often hauling, you know, props or, um, you know, auto parts or whatever. So I've been able to use it for work, um, and be helpful there. And then, um, personally, you know, I like to go camping and surf and mountain bike and, you know, the van is pretty much just like rubber floor mats Mm -hmm. and I can just throw muddy mountain bikes and, you know, the wet dog in the back and, I literally get in there with a broom and sweep it out with a broom, yeah. uh, you know, once a month. So That's it's fantastic. just pure utility. I, I love that. Well, I think when you get a used car, especially one yeah. that was like cheap or, yeah. you know, you don't care a ton about it. <laughs> it actually yeah. gives you a lot of freedom to exactly. like, do whatever you want. That's the big difference. Because I've had cars where, you know, I am, uh, feel I do feel like I need to wash it or detail it, mm-hmm. you know, every month. And um I can't eat in the car or whatever. <laughs> this one, I'm like eating donuts, you know, there's like yeah, frosting on the, the seats. Yeah. There's like, you know, it gets pretty gross in there, but it, it's like pure function, you know, and I kind of like that. I don't have to care. I can, you know, run up curbs and, uh, you know, <laughs> scratch the wheels and, you know, get it scraped up. And it's just, it's fine because at the end of the day, when I sell it, it's not going to be worth any less because of that. Yeah. So, yeah, well, it might actually be worth more because yeah. you said you were upgrading for off-roading too. Yeah. So I, um, when I got the van, you know, these, like these NV 200s are pretty much, uh, built for like city, uh, you know, contractors where, you know, you're, they're not so much commuter vehicles. So they come with these tiny, like pizza cutter wheels. They're like the, the tires are like cheap as possible. They're like this wide. And I think it's like a fort, a fort, no, a 15 inch rim with, I don't know what the width on the tire is, but it's crazy. And basically the, because of that, the gearing on it, when you get on the highway, it's like, uh, they're pretty slow, um, and not good for long travel. So basically I, 
for pure function, basically, I, uh, you know, I put a lift on the front of it to even yeah. it out because when you get the car, it's like this because oh, it's, it's meant to haul, load, right? it's meant to haul a heavy load. So I've got, um, some custom two and a half inch, um, like a custom two and a half lift kit up for the front, which goes, um, basically above the front struts, oh, okay. um, threw that in. Um, and then, um, along with some new, uh, struts from uh, carparts.com. Nice. Um, cause the struts, when I got it, were just blown out. So yeah, basically, you know, allowed the front to lift up, um, with the new struts, it's like a little bit firmer, firmer of a ride. And then I was able to fit a big, bigger wheel and tire on there. So, um, you know, at higher speeds, it just rolls better. It goes faster, nice. more efficient on the highway. And a little more clearance too. If I take it down like fire roads or for camping, you know, it's um, actually like adds function. So, oh, that's huge. Yeah, yeah. Well, and now you got to talk about all that stuff to the the next owner, right? Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of it's kind of one of a kind. It's like I had to. Um, I didn't fabricate the lift myself, but um, there is a company. I think it's called uh, Rocky Mountain Vans or something out of Colorado, mm. and it's basically this guy that just fabricates these. Uh, lift kits for these vans. You know, I think he does like for the Ford E uh, 350 vans and um, some Nissans, but uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. And then uh, I took it to uh, Unique Off-Road in Huntington Beach. They're the ones that actually uh, put the lift and the struts in the front um, just because I don't physically have the uh, impact tools, like the pneumatic impact tools in my garage. Yeah, so I was like, you know, I'm just going to let these guys do it and Oh, that's not yeah. bad either. You yeah. Know? But you have done that before, right? You know, the struts and. Um, I've done struts, but I mean, most of the work I've done, honestly, is like engine. Um, so, you know, I've swapped, I've done like a few engine swaps um, in my driveway and all that. But it was more out of, again, necessity. Like I blow a motor and I don't have money to go uh, <laughs> pay a shop, you know, 10 grand to put a new motor in. So I'm like, I'm going to go to the junkyard, Fine, get well. a motor. And, uh, throw it in. So I have done that, but I haven't done a lot of suspension work, um, to be honest. Um, so I've left that to the pros because oh, <laughs> I'm okay not a pro too. on that, but yeah, well, and that's kind of yeah. how I am too, where it's like, if yeah. it's something easy, then I'll take it on. But if it's yeah. something that might kill me, I'll usually, you know, check yeah, it out. I started to do the, so I basically was, uh, I had the, the struts, um, and the lift on the front, but the, uh, pneumatic tools, the, or the impact, driver I had just wasn't compact enough. Mm. Like you get the cheap ones that are maybe, um, you know, a 12 volt one and not pneumatic. And it's like, they're really big. So I don't have like the air compressor and the, and the tight pneumatic tools. You need to fit in th those spaces and do it. So no, I was doing a lift you need to, to like, get a lift would your... help. Yeah. yeah. That's one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that, that's awesome. I think that the fact that you could see a vehicle like that on Craigslist and be like, Oh, yeah. I could just tweak it a little bit and turn it into something that's useful. Yeah. Yeah. Pure uh, function. Walk me through the, the Craigslist, you know, process. Cause I, I remember one of the best cars I ever got was my, my second car it was a, you know, third car, maybe it was mm -hmm. a G35. I think at the time it was only a year or two old. And for whatever reason, this guy was selling it with 15,000 miles for like 25 grand and mm -hmm. it was worth like 37. So I was like, okay. And I had to drive out to Temecula, you know, I was in Orange County at the time, mm -hmm. drove out to Temecula, the shady street mm -hmm. and, and then paid cash for it. And it all worked out. But trying to find that, I was actually on Craigslist for maybe like two months of like yeah. just checking all the time. Is, yeah, that, yeah. is that kind of how you do it? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just, I'm one of those people that just likes to scroll Craigslist for fun. Like, if, you know, like I'll, like before bed, I'm like, oh, let me just hop on Craigslist and see. So sometimes it's opportunistic and like things that just pop up. But sometimes I'll have an idea for something specific I want mm -hmm. and I'm looking for it. Um, uh, a lot of it's been the latter and with, most of the cars I've had, they're pretty cheap and just like kind of a dime a dozen. Mm. So I'm just looking for the cheapest available of that car, you know? Are there any like red flags or things you look for in terms of like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Cause I, I was always like, I want it under 70,000 miles or something. Yeah. That's, a, I mean, miles for sure. I would say, um, you know, the cars I've had, I mean, things I look for are, yeah, miles, um, but then interior wear. So, mm. you know, if it, if it's a car that says it has, you know, only 90 K miles and the t interior is just torn Thrash. up and the steering wheels messed up. And like, that's kind of usually a sign that maintenance hasn't been done too well. And mm. that person didn't care for the car too. That's not always the case, but it just kind of like throws you off a little bit. Um, uh, you know, 
definitely uh, a huge one is as stock as possible. Mm. So you don't, you know, uh, people doing aftermarket uh, engine work isn't really an added value. It actually takes away from the value unless it's a known issue. So like, you know, with my van, like, yeah, it's, you know, leveled out and all that, but mechanically I haven't done anything to it. I mean, not that I would want to anyways, but um, you just can never trust somebody else's work, you know? So you want an engine that's uncracked, unbroken, you know, unless they actually state like, hey, this engine was rebuilt, you know, at 200,000 miles, here's this many miles I have since, here's the receipts from, you know, the shop that did it. And you're getting enough of a price discount to justify the risk. Yeah. You know, but in general, you want stock, bone stock. No, yeah. that's a that's a fantastic tip. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, even with the interior, because the, the interior, I, I remember I, uh, a friend of mine and I used to go to the car auctions from yeah. like the police and city of Torrance. Or no, no. It was this city of industry. That's what mm. I said. And you look at these vehicles and the souped up tuner cars. <clears throat> yeah. They're tempting because they're like, oh, it has all the parts already. But yeah. then it's like. How did that person drive this car? Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, hard. Really hard. Hard. It, like, that engine's going to be yeah. rough. But Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, like, what, what are some of the issues that people should look out for? Because I, I actually yeah. had, like, a checklist where I'm like, okay, turn it on, see if there, you know, smoke coming out the back, and yeah. just, like, the easy stuff. Yeah, that's pretty good. I mean, start with that. I mean, um, you know, definitely, um, like I said, look at the interior, look at the engine itself, and, it, you know, just look for visible leaks, Um, and just, if the engine bay looks dirty and, you know, it's full of gunk and dust, you know, when that oil comes out, dust sticks to it and it just develops this gunk. I mean, that's a sign that it hasn't been maintained or cared for. Um, you know, like you said, you know, look for smoke coming out of the back or if it smells like it's burning Mm. oil, um, you know, obviously check the oil, make sure, you know, it's been, um, you know, it's got regular oil changes. Um, I mean, those are the surface level ones. And then obviously if you don't have a lot of mechanical experience, like it's always recommended, just take it to a shop, pay somebody to check it out, you know, but for the, it really is a sliding scale. Like if you're buying like a newer car, you know, let's say a car that's only a couple years old and it has 20,000 miles, you probably don't have to worry about much of that stuff because modern cars in general are pretty stout. Um, in, you know, the low mileage realm, um, you know, uh, you definitely want to start it up, let it warm up, listen for an engine knocks, um, or any ticks. Mm. You know, I remember one time I was looking for, um, I was shopping for a E90, uh, BMW three series, like, and uh, just as a daily driver. And I, uh, you know, I was looking on Craigslist, but then I was like, Oh, let me go to this car lot and just look at this one that I saw that was a good deal. So started it up, drove it around the block and I heard a ticking from the motor and the, and the guy actually tried to tell me, he's like, Oh, that's normal with these motors. Like (laughs) they actually just tick. Like when you get them worn up, I didn't say anything. I was like, okay, okay. (laughs) All right. Or you haven't run this for like five years and no idea what it is. (laughs) So don't listen to used car dealers, you know, just use common sense and, um, the engine should not tick (laughs) or rattle. Like we'll or rattle. That. Yeah, yeah, or rattle. I think my, yeah. my first car, I had a 93 Eclipse, and it was yeah. uh, in line four. The thing was just a dog, but yeah. like I got it. I think it was like $3,000 or something. And we found out later that the alternator mount was broken mm-hmm. and was literally held on with chicken wire, mm-hmm. like actual chicken wire was just wrapped around it. Yeah. And then we're like, oh, okay. And that was a dealer. That was yeah. a used car dealer. So, anyways, well, yeah, it, yeah. it could happen there too. Yeah, Eclipse, <laughs> that's like ripe for uh, bad upgrades right oh there. well what in happened with this car was it had been it had been totaled he didn't mention that he yeah, didn't say yeah. salvage title or anything and it was just like the front when it went into work on the car it's like every bolt was stripped everything was bondo like yeah. the whole thing was like barely together so yeah that's look it, for that stuff <laughs> that's actually a good uh topic is the status of the title so i bought vehicles that are you know a clean title branded title rebuilt title and honestly um they're all it's you know, you can get a big discount with, or or I'll say this, like just because something has a rebuilt, um, title doesn't mean it's a bad car. Mm, So, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, if, you know, if a car gets hit in the front end or back end and the bodywork gets messed up, um, oftentimes it's so expensive to do body work and all that, that they're just going to, the insurance company's just going to brand it as, um, rebuilt or whatever, or they're, um, and so it doesn't mean that it's a bad car or there's anything wrong with it. It just cosmetically, it might've got really messed up. 
Um, yeah, in those scenarios, often, you know, I've bought rebuilt or branded titles where they'll have photos of uh, the car after it got the damage. Mm -hmm. And then you just want to crawl under there, look for frame damage, um, you know, look for broken mounts, stuff like that. Um, and as long as the, the frame is straight um, and you can see it was, you know, mostly cosmetic, then um, it might actually be a good deal. Um, oftentimes there's limits on the insurance you could put on those cars. Oh, but that's a good point. If too. you're somebody like me that just pays cash, like my van is actually a, a, a branded title, huh. but it means I saved a couple thousand dollars and, you know, the back, the bumper was like all messed up and they kind of did a shoddy job, like putting the bumper cover back on and stuff. And, you know, but it doesn't matter because it's just the back end. It's just body yeah, work. Cares. So, yeah. you yeah, know, it means time. I got a cheaper van. There you go. So no, that that's a great point too. And I yeah. think for, well, and even if it is salvage title or yeah. I think these days you just got to watch out for the, the flooded cars from like, you know, flooded, hurricane yeah. Yeah. things and are like, yeah. Yeah, what happened to this car? Oh, it's totally perfect. Yeah. And it's 50,000 under value. And you're like, yeah. No, <laughs> if it sounds too good to be true, yeah, most of the time it is, is yeah. my experience. But except yeah. for my G35, because that car was amazing. And yeah, it, it never had problems. All right, folks, we've got something special coming up. It's time to pause for a moment and hear a word from our sponsor. Stay tuned, you won't want to miss this. For two decades, PowerStop has had one mission top quality brake upgrades for every ride. With one box, you get pads, rotors, and hardware available for 98% of vehicles. Upgrade with PowerStop. Brake with confidence. Get yours now at carparts.com. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, one of the best, like probably my favorite car I've ever had was a 96, uh, Honda Civic EK hatchback. Oh. And, um, it was from like a tuner kid that like, you know, he had like adjustable coilovers on it and it was slammed to the ground. And it was like, it was actually matte black. Like the whole thing was matte black and it had steelies on oh, it. That's cool. Um, and I th it was like a B series motor. I don't know what the exact like engine code was on it, but um, yeah, you know, the kid like did some work to it, but uh, that thing was actually the best car I've ever had. I drove it for multiple years and it ran so good. Um, and uh, unfortunately, one time I was driving uh, back to my college town from home and uh, the radiator blew on the freeway uh. and then the engine overheated. And before I saw what was happening, it warped the heads and it basically ruined, ruined the motor. It. So it was like a really sad ending. But um, that's an example of like, you know, if the car is cheap enough, you can take a risk and sometimes it works out. Yeah, and and that car ended up being like the best thing ever. So. Well, I, I do think in terms of if you want to get into automotive culture or, yeah. <clears throat> you know, you want to have a, like a project car or sidecar or something like that. Like, yeah, do the Craigslist thing, buy it cash. Like, you don't yeah. stress about it too much because with <laughs> new cars, like I have a Tesla now and I'm yeah. like, I don't want to touch this thing <laughs> no. because yeah. who knows what's going to happen to the warranty or the batteries yeah. or a million different you know electronic issues. So I'm just not touching, but eventually, yeah, I probably will. Yeah. It's just I don't want to mess it up right now. So no, I would not recommend that. Yeah, yeah, yeah just get a <laughs> get a beater and yeah. uh, mess around with it in your garage, and you'll 100%. learn a bunch of stuff, and and you'll have fun with the car. So I think that's the point. Yeah, hundred percent. Like I mean, a big thing is probably, you know, obviously when you're young and you start out, you can't afford multiple cars usually, but um, you know, start with a car that's easy to fix. You know, something. Um, you know, if you live in certain states like that is uh, exempt from emissions testing, oh. you know, that doesn't have, you know, the OBD2. I'm not I'm not an expert on uh, electronics, but like pre OBD1 or 2, mm. I suppose, whatever, uh, you know, I, I guess in general 70s and before somebody can let me know exactly when that started. But um, <laughs> but all I know is like, you know, I learned to work the first car I worked on was a 70 eight Chevy love, mm. which is like basically an Isuzu, um, branded as a Chevy here in the United States. And it was Chevy's first entry into like the mini truck, um, segment to compete with Datsun. But oh, it's that's like, cool. that's what I learned on. It's a, it's a straight four, um, carbureted, you know, you open the engine bay and it's like, you see everything right there. Yes. You have spark, you know, you have the air you have the exhaust and you have fuel and it's like, it can only be one of you know one of these things so uh, that's great advice because yeah. it's if you get a modern car like anything yeah. uh, even the 93 eclipse i was just yeah. like oh it, god yeah. trying to fit your hands inside yeah. like it makes everything a pain in the butt 100 percent. like start with the basics like um i think um it's intimidating with modern vehicles um and i i think i see more and more you know people just gravitating towards 
newer performance cars and just paying for those for that experience versus like it used to be more common to build something up because mm. it was easier. Uh, at least that's what I see. Um, well, less I, electronic components and computer issues. Yeah. And like with modern, you know, you can go buy, you know, a newer, you know, Mustang or something for, you know, probably what you would spend to make a Civic, you know, you'd spend a lot more just to make an older car mm -hmm. that fast, you know, you can, but, um, so I see, you know, why people go that route, but, um, there's something about like building a car and knowing that what you did makes a drive how it does, you yes. know, and just being able to do it yourself is pretty cool. Well, and even just the, the frustration that comes with like, oh, okay, I put in a cold air intake on my car and now the fuel to air ratio is all jacked up and, mm -hmm. you know, and if you don't know how to fix that stuff, then you're going to have to go to somebody versus get an older car, yeah. figure out how all the components work. And then you could always learn the, the other side eventually, yeah. but you'll get results sooner, which yeah. is going to make you a much better mechanic long run because yeah. I gave up on cars after, yeah. or no, I didn't give up on cars, but I gave up on like getting my hands super dirty yeah. after the eclipse because it was such a pain in the butt. And so yeah. now I'm getting back into it and I'm like, okay, that, your route's way better than, you know, getting some super souped up modern car that I'm not going to be able to touch. Yeah. You know, and I guess like whatever you're into at the end of the day with whatever makes you excited, I think it's important to get the car that you're excited about because ultimately cars are a pain in the ass and like um they you Don't know they're difficult <laughs> and you're gonna like get bloody knuckles and you're gonna be you know super frustrated and like so you need to get a car where you go out and look at it and you're excited about mm -hmm. um you know and whether you're doing you know rebuilding your motor or just doing bolt-ons like at the end of the day um, whatever gets you excited. No, that's, that's great advice. Yeah. Uh, and, and fantastic tips just for anybody in general who wants to learn about, you know, cars or working on cars or, yeah. you know, just not being afraid to get your hands dirty. Cause you know, like I said, when you have yeah. a brand new car, you never want to touch that thing cause you don't want to break it. Exactly. Yeah. And like, if you, I guess what I was, you know, going to say is like, um, ideally, you know, if you can get to the spot, the place where you have a really reliable daily driver, um, and then you have your project car that you can work on because in my experience, I've had, you know, some of the most stressful moments in my <laughs> life are when like, I'm relying on the car I'm working oh, on yeah. and I have to get to school or I have to get to work. And, you know, then I'm like, you know, having to take a taxi and like, it just, you know, where the thing breaks down and you just have no transportation. So that's why you, you have know, to get a motorcycle too. Yeah, you know? There you go. <laughs> I mean, yeah, as long as you have two forms of transportation, you know, I would, if you're going to do any serious work to your car, uh, definitely don't get stuck with just like being stressed terrifying. out because the, your project is your transportation. Yes. So well, and always expect it to take longer than you yeah. think it is. Cause I'm, I'm always way too optimistic with everything. Yeah. Oh, that's like a weekend. Like 100%. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. No, like double or triple the time probably. Yeah. Just in case. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. This has been fantastic. I think we'll definitely have to have you back on soon to talk about the, the engine swap, which you mentioned, which yeah. I think, uh, you know, is probably the scariest thing for people to uh, take on. Uh, yeah. But we're going to talk about how it isn't and everybody should do it. Cool. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> All right, gearheads and enthusiasts. That's another lap completed here at the In the Garage podcast by CarParts.com. Thanks for taking this ride with us today. Don't forget to check out CarParts.com for all your automotive needs because we know you value quality and convenience. Keep those engines purring, stay safe on the roads, and remember, no matter what your automotive interests are, we're here to fuel your passion. Until next time, I'm Mark DeGrasse.